I had this idea this morning as I was driving my daughters to school. I was thinking back to early on in Windows development when I would do some encryption development where I would want to create a client that could talk to another client securely. And one of the things I wanted to do is come up with a, uh, a way to randomly generate a seed to use to generate my keys in encryption. One thing I would do at the time is I'd open up a window and I'd have the user move the mouse around. And by moving the mouse around, it would capture information from the mouse to use that as the seed for the random number generation. So the idea is uh, most of the time when we're generating random numbers in computers, we're using the built-in random function, which looks at like the timestamps. Like, oh, we've had this many ticks or this many milliseconds or nanoseconds have elapsed since uh, the computer booted or whatever it is. And we'll use that as the seed. So the idea being that no one else knows exactly when you started. So they don't know when the next number is going to occur. That's good enough for some random things, but when you really want to be secure, you really need something more effective because if you're generating a random number based off the number of seconds that have elapsed since the computer booted up, well, that's a pretty small set of numbers that someone could choose from. So someone else could easily exhaust that set of numbers. Now, ideally, in generating random numbers, you want to not have any idea. So here I have a 20-sided a dice. So the idea behind a real random number, a true random number, is that you cannot predict what number will show up next. You're, the first time I roll this, you won't know what number it's going to be. So I roll this. And there's, there was no way for you to know that was going to be a 12. But then the other thing is that there's no way for you to know or what, what it is now, the fact that it's a 12 now, has no impact on what it's going to be next. So if I roll this again... It's a one. So there's no way to predict from a 12 that a one's going to be next. And of course, if I roll it again, what the fact that it's been a 12 and a one has no impact on what it's going to be next. So it could be a 12 again, it could be a one again, or it could be some completely different number. So that's the idea behind true random numbers. Usually we're using pseudo random numbers, which have things in effect to uh, control the, C, the, uh, the period of how often they generate. But I was thinking, what would be a great way to generate? true random numbers. Now, most true random number generators have something that capture information from the physical world. And that way, because of this, the randomness, the chaos of the world around us, it's able to generate something that's random, or at least random according to our definition of random. In theory, if you were to know the state the universe started in and you knew all the rules about the universe, you could predict everything that's going to happen beyond our current level. So if you get information from the physical world, that should be random. So that's the idea by moving the mouse around is a person's never going to move the mouse around exactly the same way twice. So I was thinking on a mobile device, how would I generate a random number on here, right? Am I going to open a window and let the user just tap their finger around in there? That doesn't make any sense. I lost my cord. <laughs> that doesn't make any sense. But I realized, it occurred to me, this thing is loaded full of sensors. It's got a gyroscope, it's got an accelerometer, it's got a magnetic compass, it's got a GPS, it's got all these great sensors and it's got a light sensor in it. Those sensors are collecting data about the physical world. So in theory, we could pull all that data, all that sensor data, and use that to create our random numbers. So let's take a look at what I did here. Kind of a, a silly proof of concept, but it was kind of fun, you know, just something fun to do. So on my form, I have three sensor components. Uh, originally I was thinking about using the, the sensor manager to just go and get all the sensors from the system, but I decided to simplify it for first, just kind of to proof of concept. And I just used the ones that we have components for here. So the location sensor, which uses the GPS. And actually, an interesting thing about sensors on mobile devices or on devices in general is some of them are physical sensors and some of them are logical sensors. So the location sensor actually uses a combination of information, it uses the GPS, it uses Wi-Fi triangulation, a number of things in order to get you a location. So that's how you can have a fine location versus coarse location, for example. But anyway, we're using the location sensor, the motion sensor, and the orientation sensor. And then I'm using a timer here. The timer is what I use to pull these two. And I started all with the switch here. So let's look at the code real quick. In the code, uh, I go through at the timer, I just go to the motion sensor and I get all the data from it. And the orientation sensor, get all the data from it. And I call this add double routine. And all it does is looks to see if the value that was passed to it is not a number, 
which uh, if the if the sensor doesn't exist or maybe the sensor doesn't uh, only provides acceleration but not uh, angle acceleration, for example, then it only returns. Well, I have a typo in there. I'll fix it later. It's not not a big deal. For all intents and purposes, it's still going to work. Anyway, because I'm repeating here, acceleration, Y. It should be angle acceleration. So if it's not a number, then we're going to add it to this big string. Now, I'm doing it in strings just because it was easy for debugging purposes. But in reality, we're better off doing this as a uh, array of bytes. But it essentially, we're making a little more work for the computer because we're converting it from a number into a string into a number to a string back and forth, which we don't need to do for actual data. So then here's the key right here. I'm using the a hash function to hash that string. So the way a hash works is it's a one-way algorithm and there's a, any slight change in the string produces a dramatic, or the input produces a dramatic change in the output. And there's no way to know from the input, or I'm sorry, there's no way to know from the output what the input was. Okay, so what we're gonna do is we're gonna go through and we're gonna keep getting more and more data. Oh, there's one more thing here that's not shown. Uh, the location sensor has an event that fires and I get the latitude and longitude uh, from there. I can actually get more data from the location sensor, but just that's all I did for now. It has like a, some some location sensors have altitude and uh, other things as well. So we collect all this data and then we're just going to hash it. So actually I'll run it here on Windows first, which is one thing I love is that you can run this on Windows and get that really fast turnaround time. So here we go. Here it's running on Windows. Now my Windows box only has a location sensor. And the location sensor doesn't change that often because it's actually using Wi-Fi triangulation. It's not using GPS. But if we're using uh, GPS, actually, you'd see this change a lot more often, even when you're holding still, because it's actually pulling a location more accurate than it actually can get, which is kind of a weird thing. It's one of those weird things about how sensors work. And so you'll see the location change more often. But this here, you can see this is the hash that was generated off of the location. So if I run this again, see this is 173. And if I run this again, I'll probably get a different value there. Let's see. Or the, unless the OS cached it. Yeah, the OS cached it. So that's going to be the same value hashed this time. So now let's run it on my Android device and see what it looks like on there. Here it is running on my Nexus 7. I'll go ahead and activate it. We see it's generating data. Uh, if you actually look at the data that's coming in here, you can find where you have the similar numbers, but they're not exactly the same. There's subtle changes in them each time because of the uh, inaccuracy in sensors. So even if the device is holding completely still, it's still going to uh, have subtle shifts in there. And then it's being hashed up at the top and you see the value that's being generated from that.